A memoir essay is a piece of writing that draws on the writer's past and uses that past for self-reflection. Unlike a personal essay that might be pulled from the past or the present and be focused on any topic, from the merits or demerits of chewing gum to whether graffiti is vandalism or public art, a memoir essay must evolve from a writer's intimate recollections of the past brought together with thoughtful reflections on those memories. The memoir essay returns to the writer's old griefs and struggles in hopes of understanding, or at least acknowledging them. The, ter the term memoir is derived from French and means reminiscence. It is an evocative word because reminiscence is much more than just memory. To reminisce means to recover innate knowledge held by the soul or the subconscious. This is the knowledge that comes out of a collective and ancient sense of the human. So the very idea of writing a memoir essay embeds within it personal retrieval and revelation. So let me give you an example. David Owen, a longtime staff writer for The New Yorker, wrote an essay a few years ago called Scars. In the piece, he used the marks on his body as a kind of map of his childhood and adolescence. Over the years, Owen writes, your body becomes a kind of historical document in which certain dramatic moments are memorialized in scar tissue. So on the one hand, Owen's scars are a handy means for accessing certain memories. The gouge on his toe is from cherry bomb shrapnel. A mark on his arm came from molten G.I. Joe. A chipped tooth is from a sledding accident, and a dimple in his cheek is the result of falling off his tricycle seat, on which he'd been standing. And yet, as the wounds accumulate, Owen's scars come to represent more than hard pain followed by slow healing. In his essay, these scars represent not only resilience, but also loss. In particular, they represent the loss of his childhood friend, Duncan, who died relatively young at age 52, and who was present at many of the everyday disasters that contributed to Owen's injuries. For while scars tell the tale of a body's resistance, they also predict a body's death. And so Owen's recollections in the full reminiscence of his memoir essay reveal this profound and melancholy truth. Our scars determine our losses as much as they attest to our will to survive. In this way, a memoir essayist looks backwards in order to teach forwards. What I mean is that any private recollection stemming from a writer's narrow, individual life, such as the scars on one's body, should ultimately shed light on the lives of countless others he might never actually meet. There's a whole wide world of people with their own scar tissue memorials, and David Owen's essay invites those people in. After reading Scars, I found myself thinking about the raised bump on my middle finger and the hairline slice along my right ear and the scooped out hollow on my left shin that looks like the mark left from a large tooth my daughter has always called this scar on my shin my shark bite. She likes to pretend that I survived an encounter with a great white shark that embedded one of its teeth in my leg. I also thought about much more serious wounds beyond my own, those that come from major surgery and from war. And then I considered the scars that aren't visible, the ways in which we injure, injure our hearing or our brains or our hearts perhaps in both senses. So reading Owen's memoir essay opened up associations for me that are about my own injuries and also about the very nature of human injury and what scars both suggest and symbolize. In other words, any memoir essay is yet another opportunity for a writer to connect his private memories to the public interests of a wider audience. And who exactly is this audience? I think it's helpful to remember how Virginia Woolf so perfectly captured the group she called common readers. That is, a reader guided by an, insti an instinct to create for himself, out of whatever odds or ends he can come by, some kind of whole, a portrait of a man, a sketch of an age, a theory of the art of writing. 
As writers of memoir essays, we should always hold this common reader in our minds, while also asking ourselves, am I just remembering, or am I actually reminiscing? I say that because to remember is really just a form of narcissism, but to reminisce, to combine retrieval with revelation, taps into collective human history. Okay, to think a little bit further about how to write your own memoir essay, let's dig into a piece by a former student of mine named Matt Fleer. Matt was an economics major at my college, and he was the valedictorian of his class. This particular essay is about a study tour Matt took to South Africa with a group of honor students. It was the first time he'd ever traveled out of the country. Matt titled his essay, Opening My Eyes, and I'll start at the beginning. I gripped my handhold, knuckles white, trying to steady myself in the dinghy boat traveling fast over high swells on my last day in Durban, South Africa. The boat is small, the kind held above the water with big, black, inflatable sides, and I'm on my way to swim with sharks. Above all else, the reviews I read emphasized safety, but I'm next to the cage now, and its metal has some rust, a few dents, and one too many gaps. Our captain looks at me and grins a grin, somewhere between playfulness and comfort. We finally arrive where the sharks are, eight kilometers of Indian Ocean separating me from the cold sand of a beach I had never been to before in a city I'd been told to fear. Our captain, clad in a wetsuit like the rest of us, but somehow not shivering in the morning chill, starts to speak. I hear sounds, but I'm not listening. My eyes are on the cage. I'm not claustrophobic by nature, but that thing isn't big. Did he say that four of us had to fit in it? And the bars look thin. Could it possibly hold? Sharks, I hear. My eyes flick back to the captain. They'll be around 20 or 30. We got here early so that we could get you out before they ate. They'll be hungry. He grins that grin again and tosses chum over his shoulder. He looks over the side. My eyes follow his and I see them. The fins. What am I doing here? Sure, I'll jump into the the St. Mary's River, a body of water whose shores I've called home during my brief college career, where I'm familiar with the fish and crabs and other water creatures. But now I'm here in South Africa, surrounded by beasts, and all I know is what I've seen on TV, teeth and jaws and anger and hunger and death. The captain slides the cage into the water, pulls it close to the side of the boat, and opens the top. Turn around so your legs are hanging over the side of the boat and in the cage. You'll just slide off the boat and right in. His stare and that smile of his tell me that it's time. And so I swing my legs over the boat's side. I see the outlines of the sharks breaking from their methodical movements to snap their jaws over slivers of innocent chum. I don't want this, but it's too late. I've paid my 800 rand. I look again at the captain, and in that calming Afrikaans accent, he says to me, You're safe in the cage. He squeezes my shoulder and gives me a push on my back. I take a deep breath, slide off the side, and hide myself behind tightly shut eyes. There is a lot to praise in Matt's opening. For one, he's doing a brilliant job of offering up sharp, precise, and vivid details. Matt doesn't write in vague generalizations or with a bunch of boring and then this is what I did minutia. In the moment of greatest tension, just before Matt slides into that cage, he does not tell the reader. My legs were over the side and I could see the sharks eating the chum. This statement that I've just made up might be factual. It's probably accurate to what happened on that day, but it's also imprecise and dull. Why? Well, it's imprecise because we aren't told anything about these specific sharks in this particular moment, their size, type, look, or how they move and eat. And it's dull because writing that my my legs were over the side and I could see the sharks eating the chum doesn't offer us any insight into how Matt is feeling at this moment. 
After reading this made-up sentence, we would have no idea why watching the sharks eat chum is significant to Matt's recollection. Now, what Matt actually writes is far better. He says, I swing my legs over the boat's side. I see the outlines of the sharks breaking from their methodical movements to snap their jaws over slivers of innocent chum. There is so much more precision here, so much more arresting and evocative detail. For one, Matt uses exact verbs to recreate particular actions. He swings his legs, and the sharks break their swimming to snap their jaws. Matt also employs just the right imagery to reveal his uneasiness. The sharks are mere outlines under the water, sinister shapes that he can't quite see, and the pieces of chum are innocent slivers which symbolically stand in for Matt himself, his own vulnerable legs dangling over the side of the boat. I want to note, too, that Matt describes the shark's movements as methodical. This evokes a sense of viciousness, calculated and cold. In any memoir essay, it's crucial to plumb the depths of your recollections for precise details about the time and the place you're trying to recall. If you can't quite remember certain details, then do your homework. You need precision if you want your memories to come alive. The cedar smell of your father's workshop, where he kept the thick leather belt that he used for spanking, or the Starbucks mocha latte that the doctor was holding when he sailed into the delivery room after 17 hours of hard labor and told you to dazzle him with your next push. Spend time with old photographs, looking not only at the faces and the outdated fashions, but also at the objects, buildings, and landscapes that frame the people. Return to the places where your memories first happened, to the very spot in the yard where your older brother dug a shallow grave to bury your first dog, or to the shady place beside that cracked basketball court where you parked your car after your boyfriend dumped you and cried for hours. Ask family members and friends what they recall about the people and places of, and events that you're trying to recreate. Take notes. Then, when you're ready to turn your notes into a memoir essay, wake up your details by employing some of the same techniques that Matt uses. Choose exact verbs. Create vibrant and relevant imagery. Use just the right adjective to describe the best noun that you can find for the job. Without this level of precision, your memories can easily become flabby and generic. But I also want you to be careful not to cram copious amounts of detail into every margin of your memoir. Without an emotional investment to connect such details to the greater purpose of your essay, your packed prose will quickly become as tedious as the chapters on the science of whales in Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Another way to think about what I'm saying is to evoke that old motto that you need to show more than you need to tell. Matt didn't want just to come out and say that the sharks were hungry and scary. He wanted to show these sharks for the methodical, cold-blooded killers that he feared they were. So Matt successfully woke up his recollections through precise, emotionally-driven details. And as a result, his memories come alive for his readers. And we feel as if we're there in the boat with him, about to slither down into the shark cage. Okay, in addition to Matt's command of detail, I want to point out that he also makes sure to maintain the tension in the scene. How? Well, on the one hand, Matt displays his personal insecurities, but on the other, he also shows his unspoken courage. He's not the hero of this essay, but he's not the victim either. Instead, Matt is both insecure and attentive to what's happening around him. In trying to muster the courage to swim with the sharks, he shows us repeatedly that he's terrified to do it. And even when Matt slides off the boat and into the water, he keeps his eyes tightly shut. That's interesting. That's complex. And that's honest. So a memoir essay doesn't need to be memory dressed up as a heroic tale. 
It also shouldn't be a lament about how hard you had it in the past and how unlucky you are now. A memoir essay isn't the place to wreak revenge on that kindergarten bully or on your masochistic soccer coach. Your motivation should be to grapple with the struggle of it all, with the mess. Matt's piece is about his struggle, about trying to get himself into those shark-infested waters. And it's here, in relating the human struggle, that memoir essays matter to your reader. Now, I've been singing Matt's praises, but I do have to say that his opening is not yet fully memoir, not really. It's from memory, yes, and it's doing a darn good job of recreating that memory. But Matt isn't yet reflecting on what he's remembering. He's just remembering. And in order for his piece to rise to the level of true memoir, he needs to reminisce. Just as there's a risk in swimming with sharks, there's also a risk in revealing one's insecurities as the basis of memoir essays. And so Matt has to shift from thinking about bodily risk to considering his psychological, moral, spiritual, and emotional risks. To write memoir, Matt must be vulnerable to his readers, and not just to the sharks. He needs to link his external observations to a kind of internal honesty. And he needs to take the risk of confession and candor. In the next section of his essay, Matt starts to move in this direction. After admitting to the reader that he closed his eyes while slipping into the, into the shark cage, he goes on to talk about other experiences he had while traveling in South Africa. For instance, he writes, I am on a bus headed to the small township of Langa, one of many townships where, during apartheid, the whites forced the blacks to relocate, and where many blacks have been trapped ever since. This will be an area where my fellow travelers and I are sure to be the only white people, an area with extreme poverty to make the worst inner-city projects in the States look like luxurious accommodations. I have no real idea how such destitution will look. All I know is what I've seen on the news or in documentaries. Collapsing houses, contaminated water, gangs, crime, and dying children. Inside this bus, I see faces I know. I hear accents like my own. In the front row, our guide talks on the microphone. He's deep into his explanation of the apartheid past I know so well from a recent history class. All is recognizable. All is comforting. But then I look out the window. Through the dirty glass, I see the outskirts of the township. Houses made of shipping containers, underfed stray dogs running to smell the severed goat heads being prepared by women, whose faces are smeared in a strange white paste. Outside the window, I'm surrounded by people who look different from me, immersed in a culture I know nothing about. I am a human among sharks, and soon I'll have no boat to protect me. The bus comes to a stop, and it is time to get out. I step down and pause. I don't want this. I don't know what I'm doing. A push on my backpack tells me to get going. So I take a deep breath, step out, and for a moment, I take refuge in the childlike escape of shutting my eyes. Then, I open my eyes. The langa I see is not the one of my mind. I do not see fear. Instead, we are met at the door of a woman's apartment and offered a taste of the pumpkin meal that has been prepared for our arrival. One of the other residents in this complex, after offering a sip of coffee out of her own mug, takes us with pride into her closet-sized room shared by three other families. I see ten men gathered close together in a dimly lit shabeen, talking in their eloquent cliques and shuffling to the side to make room for us on their bench for us foreign visitors. And then as the home-brewed beer bucket is passed, I see openness. Instead of sadness, I mostly see joy, painted with vibrant color on the faces of the children who, after overcoming their initial shyness, cling to my hands and ask to be swung into the air. 
In the Happy Feet After School Dance Program, I see older children who are so often mixed up in the gangs and the violence, choosing instead to don duck boots and demonstrate a traditional dance. And yes, I see signs of crime. Yes, I see some sadness. And I see poverty, more poverty than I've ever seen before. But throughout my trip into the Langa Township, I hear our guide's words, the last ones he spoke, as we stepped from our bus. There is still much more that needs to be done, but I am positive. I am hopeful. I see that hope. Without stating it overtly, Matt's essay has evolved from grappling with his fear of sharks into the more convoluted fears of race, class, and ethnic difference. Here, Matt is coming to recognize his relative privilege as an American tourist. He's also coming to recognize his biases about this place and these people, biases based on his textbook and mass media understandings of the history of apartheid and of South Africans. To reveal this recognition, is to take a risk. Matt's exposing himself as someone of both privilege and prejudice. While other kinds of essays also draw on real life experience, memoir essays reveal the writer's own life. They're often confessional, touching on taboo or potentially scandalous topics such as addiction, abuse, sexuality, exploitation, poverty, and oppression, or as in Matt's essay, power and privilege. Another essayist I admire is E.J. Levy, whose writing is steeped in self-scrutiny. Levy is interested in the intricacies of sexual desire, and she turns to erotic relationships she's had with women and men alike as the basis of her memoir essays. Levy has published essays on the politics of marrying a man while still thinking of herself as a lesbian, on deciding to get pregnant over the age of 40, and on her fears that in having a relationship with a man after 20 years of dating only women, she is merely dodging grief in the wake of her father's death. Levy is fully conscious that recollecting and then reflecting on her sexual exploits is risky business. In another essay, she makes that very point by comparing mushroom hunting to taking multiple lovers and to writing about such love affairs. She says... Risk is part of the pleasure, part of the reason I play this gustatory Russian roulette, gathering mushrooms. In food, as in love, I like to take my chances. The memoir essay demands that you take your chances. To write one, you must talk openly about what most people want to avoid or to hide. You must take long, hard looks at your foibles and at embarrassing or unflattering moments from your past, moments that would make other people squirm with discomfort. A memoir essay is all about the raw and brutal truth of the essayist's own life. Even so, the memoir essay shouldn't take the place of a psychiatrist's couch. When E.J. Levy writes about sex, her point isn't to be like Woody Allen ticking off neurotic longings and insecurities and vanities to a reader who is supposed to play the part of her shrink. The point of her work isn't exhibitionism either. She's not writing a collection of look-at-me-with-my-clothes-off essays. Instead, her reflections on her sexual history are meant to address the risks that every human takes when he or she falls in love. As Levy writes in that essay comparing mushroom hunting to love, I wonder if the curious appeal of the mushroom is that, in eating it, risk is redeemed. Even death is. In developing a taste for mushrooms, one cultivates a taste for decay, a distinct, even a delicious flavor. Here, in the same thing, the poisonous and the good. So like Levy, Matt is writing about a difficult topic, Memories that lay bare his personal thoughts on racial stereotypes. But instead of turning to symbolism, as Levy does, when comparing the risks of mushroom hunting to the risks of love, Matt turns to metaphor. In particular, Matt uses the dual metaphors of blindness and sight to reveal his stereotypical preconceptions about South Africans. 
First, Matt draws on the metaphor of blindness about what it means not to see or not to understand what one sees. And Matt and his fellow students climb aboard the bus to head into Langa Township. His blindness is acute. He wants to keep his gaze blinkered, focused on fellow classmates, on the tour guide speaking English through a microphone, on all that is recognizable and comforting. When Matt peeks out the window, it is through the taint of preconceived notions. He writes, Through the dirty glass, I see the outskirts of the township, houses made of shipping containers, underfed stray dogs running to smell the severed goat heads being prepared by women whose faces are smeared in a strange white paste. Matt is taking on the perspective of a white Western outsider visiting what in the 19th century was called darkest Africa. In a sense, he's a modern-day Marlowe from Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. He's in a boat of sorts moving deeper into the unknown. And Matt plugs into conventional stereotypes that come out of books such as Conrad's when he describes how Africans live in extreme poverty with shipping containers as houses, the stray dogs, Seemingly backward or taboo customs, such as eating severed goat's heads, what he calls the strangeness of the women's white face paint. Matt's fear of the differences he sees are underscored by the statement he makes in the first part of his essay. I am a human among sharks, and soon I'll have no boat to protect me. And it's here when Matt likens the people in the Langa Township to sharks that he demonstrates his willingness to look hard at his own failings in order to understand them better, to recollect them, and also to reflect upon them. From the vantage point of looking back at this moment after much time has passed, Matt concludes that thinking of these people as sharks was an ignorant fear. And I would argue that Matt's search for self-knowledge is revealed when he tells us how he stepped off the bus and closed his eyes, literally engaging in self-blinding, only to later understand that this gesture was a childlike escape. It's here that Matt admits his immaturity, and he establishes his credibility by acknowledging his blindness, because that acknowledgement also opens him up, and his readers too, to a new kind of vision, a vision of kindness, self-possession, openness, joy, and hope. There is personal peril in confessionality, but the reward in writing an honest and thoughtful memoir essay is, in the words of Socrates, to know thyself. As essayists, in knowing ourselves, we can also come to know better the world. Matt's ending to Opening My Eyes shows how this particular kind of writing, this memoir, is rooted in personal observation and frankness. His essay concludes in this way. I feel around blindly, grasping until my hand closes around the thin metal of the cage. I keep holding my breath and feel the water churning around me. I know what's out there moving the water, but I don't know if I want to see it. I open my eyes. Before the dive, I had no real understanding of sharks, They were an alien species with appearance and biology so different from my own, not even a language to connect us. I expected terrible creatures, violence and anger and death. And yes, I see hints of that. They snap at the chum, eyes rolling back into their heads with row after row of impossibly sharp teeth. But when I open my eyes, when I really open my eyes, I don't see jaws. I see elegant movement, the slightest twitch of the fin propelling the shark with incredible speed. I see 20 creatures moving with an almost choreographed grace, coming close but never colliding. I see symbiotic relationships with other fish swimming close to the sharks, gaining free protection. I see powerful piercing eyes, slowly moving gills, and smooth storm gray skin. After 10 minutes in the cage, we are pulled out of the water and back on the boat. I look back at the fins. 
This time, I'm not plagued by stomach pains of anxiety. I'm grinning. Moving back and forth in a rhythmic pattern alongside the boat, the fins remind me of a traditional African dance. And so like Matt, I urge you to write your own memoir essays with your eyes open wide, and in doing so, to discover yourself anew.